Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, my guest is Aaron Buchanan. Aaron, can you introduce yourself to the good people watching? Excellent. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Aaron. I'm a professor of cognitive analytics at Harrisburg University for, of Science and Technology. And my background is in computational linguistics, so I like words, and statistics and numbers. Um, all right, two things that I'm terrible at. Uh, we'll we'll see how this goes. This is uh, so. What's what's kind of the majority of your work? Yeah. So on the words front, I'm really interested in how people understand what words mean and how they're related to each other. So building a map of our understanding of words and essentially taking our mental dictionary and making a picture of it, seeing if that is the same across all languages or not. Probably not. Uh, I'm also interested in methods and measurement. So how do we know we're actually measuring words correctly? And that leads into the statistics half where I help people with their methods and measurement and teach people better stats. I run a stats YouTube channel called Statistics of Doom to help people learn how to do stuff, uh, mostly numbers, especially when they're terrified of numbers. Why, why is it called Statistics of Doom? <laughs> That's a longstanding joke. So my first graduate student and I really both loved Invader Zim, which was a TV show on Nickelodeon for a while. And they had a Doom song. You can find it on YouTube. And we just spent a lot of time trying to make Doom work. So that's actually the name of my research lab is the Doom Lab. It stands for Deciphering Outrageous Observations and Modeling. So. <laughs> awesome. So why don't you give us a little bit of uh, some 101 on computational linguistics? Because I, I'm not sure we've explored uh, the subject. We've done some ling linguistic stuff on here before, but, um, but this might be a little bit new for folks and for me. Excellent. So computational linguistics is a field that merges a lot of other areas. Sometimes people call this natural language processing. It's more of a global term for the, for the field. But it's the, the view of understanding uh, language and words through computer science. And so I'm a techie masquerading as a social scientist. Um, which is a joke from a friend of mine. I can't claim that sentence. But um, essentially, AI, when people talk about artificial intelligence, you're talking about computational linguistics because you have to understand language to build systems that create language. Or um, from psychology's perspective, psycholinguistics is the understanding of language and the person, or sociolinguistics, which is the understanding of language and society. So it's kind of a mix of all these different fields um, focusing on the computation part, building uh, mathematical models or uh, processing language to get some desired output. Hmm. Uh, what's the history of the field? Um, <clears throat> well, it depends on who you talk to, which field they're in. <laughs> uh, so I, my background is actually in psychology. So I would say a lot of it is based on work from um, Noam Chomsky, who's sort of the father of modern linguistics, but people from computer science would argue that a lot of this is based on ideas from Turing, of artificial intelligence and the Turing test. And so it's kind of, uh, for a long time, people were re researching in their own little areas and given the increases in computational power and computers and the internet, we've all kind of slowly merged together. Um, mm. So a data analytics person could be doing computational linguistics, but call it text analytics or sentiment analysis. So I, I teach a lot of the stuff in my classes where it's like, there are a lot of the same names for just one analysis. So if you're interested in understanding if reviews for a new restaurant are positive, text analytics, sentiment analysis, same idea. Wait, can you say that last part again? If you're, if you're. Yeah. If you're interested in like, let's say there's a new restaurant and you have their Yelp reviews, you're trying to know without reading all of them, if the um overall review is positive or not you mm. can use uh, a sentiment analysis to do the reading for you or you could call that text analytics as well or i would call it computational linguistics so mm. um uh, i like to call it computational linguistics because when you call it psychology people ask you questions that uh, you don't want to answer about freud because it has nothing to do with freud mm -hmm. and it kind of sounds scary so then they don't ask any more questions <laughs> Well, do you know James Pennebaker 
by chance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Pennebaker's work is um, pretty influential in this field. And one of, I'm going to brag, one of my former students is about to finish her PhD in that lab. And nice. so I'm super proud. And uh, I, I really I, like his stuff. Yeah. I had him on the show in the past and I had him on, uh, on Stand Up Science. Um, very recently he was actually one of the guys I, I make sure and tell my guests so i have a show that i typically tour with that's it's two scientists and two comedians on each show for a show mm -hmm. that's half comedy sets and half science talks and i make sure and tell my guests that like no one expects them to be funny and they don't have to try to be funny or anything like that and james was like he was like this is my shot i'm gonna do stand up <laughs> <laughs> the first That's time hilarious. it was actually it was actually pretty good um but uh but yeah I, I mean i i bring it up because as you were talking about analyzing um the um oh what was the wording the sent um sentiment, sentiment? Mm -hmm. um uh I, I i remember he was he had something with analyzing people's tweets and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and seeing like what their attitude at the time was or, mm -hmm. or something like that and and so so it's that that sort of stuff that you're doing yeah so i i mostly teach this kind of thing to my students um the, we actually use his software the luke in our class sometimes and um that allows us to collect information on you know how many pronouns do they use so one of his big um books is the secret life of pronouns yeah, because they do inter book. interesting things right they're really it's really interesting um but we can also look at negative emotion positive emotion um they have some other newer ones like tone that's really interesting um so his work is yeah pretty influential in uh text analytics in my own work i always do something similar but i focus more on the individual words instead of kind of these categories of words hmm so um so if i want to potentially you could build something for me so that i can only see my positive youtube reviews and podcast re <laughs> reviews <Yes. and> that, <laughs> that sort of thing i i i don't want to see any of the uh eh, that's not necessarily true sometimes they uh uh i i actually had my first one star review on my podcast recently and it was it was someone that didn't listen to the podcast and they just said 800 reviews and all five stars these are fake so that was actually like a positive one star <laughs> review my my past reviews had been so good that they didn't believe it um, that's that's a whole nother field of text analytics too <laughs> is uh flagging fake reviews really uh, yeah so I, I i don't know how to do it personally but uh like things like what amazon tries to do to help um take down reviews that are fake or um youtube's content flagging or facebook does a similar content flagging so that's just a whole bunch of text analysis as well well i i don't want to make you talk outside of your field but uh actually i do i do this to every guest as i was <laughs> like okay. oh here's the thing you don't know much about well let me ask you more questions about that <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, Pop quiz. I i i have uh as you were saying that i was going to make a joke about how no one is ever going to mistake my twitter as ai because of the number of typos i don't proofread because i'm not a coward and uh so what i what i like to do is i like to hastily write like an angry little rant and then i hit send before thinking about it or reviewing it and then the moment i hit send then i like to review it beat myself up about it see the many errors that i made but but then I, I so I was going to make a joke about that. And then I thought about, well, I guess I just sort of did. But then I thought about it. And I was like, actually, I bet that they I bet that the fake ones out there actually program in errors, if they're good to make them sound seem more, more human. Maybe. Um, I, I, huh. I, they I often have very, um, I can think of like the work for that Mike Kearney at uh, the University of Missouri has done with his Twitter 
uh, work. He, he's a his not familiar. Research, his don't quote me on his research. I follow him because he does a bunch of cool tech stuff. Um, I think he's in the communications department, but he does a bunch of um, Twitter bot detection, or at least he talks about it a lot. And I, I, with that, some of that stuff, I think what you see is the same types of language patterns over and over again across the bots. Hmm. So most people say things in different ways, even though they mean the same thing. It's one of human language's most interesting components is that we're creative and we can say things in lots of different ways. But if you're programming a bot, it tends to say the same things in the same way because it's trained on a specific set. So it kind of repeats those. And that's one of the easier ways to notice that it is fake rather than real. Um, I, that is, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I guess I, I brought that up because I had the, I think the first, one of the very first episodes of this show, so I'm sure I'm butchering this, is like almost six years ago now. I had Nick Epley on mm -hmm. in the unit. Oh, you know him? I, uh, the no. name is familiar, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and he had, I believe his book is called Mindwise. Oh my gosh, I got his name right. I got his book right. Okay, <laughs> don't screw it up now, Shane. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> And he, he did this, he had something that I've never forgot about. And, and I, I don't know how strong, I think some of this was a little bit speculative, but boy, was it fun and mind blowing. And it was about how we tend to assign um, a personality to like inanimate objects mm -hmm, once mm -hmm. they start being flawed. Um, so like you don't name your brand new car, you name your your car that you like work on yourself and has issues like old Betsy she can be a little finicky but she's always been there for you know she's got it she gets a little she gets a little grumpy when you try to start her and it's it's almost like flaws in things make them feel more human and that's when we start anthropomorphizing and mm -hmm. and and um people have this kind of um part of the suspicion so so he took that further and was talking about how part of the suspicion with like artificial intelligence just in terms of of say even um a navigational system it is is that they're almost like so perfect that people like don't don't trust it in a way they don't feel like connected to it and so so he he talked i guess there's some research early on they showed evidence that if you built in like benign flaws into into the like map narrate uh, narration systems so like have it like miss uh uh misspeak a street name or whatever mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. intentionally that made people like trust it more because mm -hmm. it like humanized it and gave it this this personality and so that's why I, I was wondering if like some of the clever bots out there were maybe um we're maybe adding flaws into it but maybe they're just like russian bots or whatever and just don't have great english both yeah there's a story that i like to tell my students about some of the original ai systems that were designed one of them was designed to sort of show that these systems are not very good and so we, the researcher at mit had their students and their secretary like talking to the system. How's the weather? Well, it's great back and forth. And I think he was surprised at how much people assigned emotion. He's like, it's just a computer program, but people will assign emotion to that, to the responses, even though they know better. Huh. Um, and then um, the small mistakes thing is funny. Although I may have lost why. <laughs> Uh, yep it's gone <laughs> i had a thought when you said you said oh there's small mistakes yeah um in in that it humanizes gone. them that's okay i i uh usually i'm the one that loses track of the idea hooray oh man i had to fill I, the role <laughs> i i got a name right i remembered a book from six years ago and i won the um who cannot lose track of their thought first game for the first time ever on the history of the <laughs> podcast man i'm i'm feeling I, I walked into this conversation 
feeling a lot of imposter syndrome and <laughs> and and now now we're uh, we're turning things around a little bit. How much do, do people ask you about Alexa? Follow up question: Can I ask you about Alexa? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, bot systems are like way above my pay grade. Okay. We talk about them in class a little bit. We have some other classes that do machine learning and how you build these chat bot systems. My class focuses on like, what is a noun? <laughs> how do we know that a verb should come next? Because you have to really understand the structure of the language you're trying to build mm. to know what should come next. So most languages are subject, verb, object oriented. English is like this. So I kicked the ball. Uh, and you, so you know I'm the one doing the action. And writing a simple system that breaks that down is actually more complex than you think because we like to talk in these kind of like streaming rivers, if you will, of clauses and phrases. So writing a system that can understand those to then respond back, like interpret correctly and respond back is really complex. So I mostly teach students just like, here's how we know what a sentence is and here's how we can break those sentences down. And the higher level classes talk about how to train um, programs. So reading in all these inputs, doing all that breakdown and putting an input back out. Um, mm. But you can still ask me about Alexa and I'll do my best. <laughs> Well, I I was uh, no need. Uh, I, although I will say this, so I don't have an Alexa. I I've been especially in this pandemic uh, as I've been having to learn all of this new technology and everything. I am I turn 40 next month, but but having to learn all of these new like streaming things and different technologies and mm -hmm. and I'm like a bit of a um, curmudgeon in, in some things in terms of like social media. I don't, I don't want any part of it. Now I'm having to be a part of it. And so, so anyhow, I'm new to a lot of this stuff. I was on the phone with a friend of mine recently and she was, um, she was like asking Alexa thing. And one of the things that she likes to do is, um, be verbally abusive to Alexa and, and Alexa will just shut down and not answer you. If you start calling Alexa like really horrible names, <laughs> Alexa will just shut down and give you the silent treatment. And I was like, that's amazing. Not only does Alexa like have enough criteria to build uh, to be uh, built in to know that that you're you're being inappropriate but then to have like a response of like uh-uh we don't we don't, <laughs> we don't play that, that game <laughs> is is so uh, uh that and that's and that's uh it's it's a different origin story of of Westworld, but uh, but still uh, a, yeah. a, a fun one, <laughs> nonetheless. So I wanted to. Uh, so let's get off of AI then. Um, do you do you do stuff with like the evolution of language at all? Um, a little bit. Most of my data is not time coursed, if that makes sense. Like we study a lot of like basic level nouns that don't change. Cat, dog. Um, I do really find the the change in slang super fascinating. So we started doing a little bit of research there. Um, but are you meaning like quick evolution? Are you talking like long-term oh, evolution? Oh, oh, I mean, origin of language type stuff. Oh, I, evolution, I, evolution. Well, uh, so just because you mentioned Chomsky and, and it made me think, so I had, I had Steven Pinker in, um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Daniel Everett on my stand-up science show uh, together uh, in Boston. And it was a really great show, but they have like two very different views yes. <laughs> on, on the language, which I love. If anytime I can get a good science rivalry going, that's, it's, a good that's one. <laughs> really exciting uh, to me. So I was, what, uh, in, in your field, what are the, what are the big, um, uh, what are the, what are the big rivalries going? Not, not individual names, but just like, um, in terms of large large theories kind of competing with one another um what are the what are people getting worked up about when you get when you go to a oh, um, computational linguistics 
<laughs> um, conference. I, I don't, I don't know that math folk get that excited. Really. <laughs> um, no, there's plenty of arguments, but I don't, I don't know that I think that they're like the nature versus nurture kind of level uh-huh. that, that that probably was. <sighs> I'm not sure if I can think of anything. I think a lot of a lot of arguments come down to like the precise measurement, which is why I mentioned I'm interested in measurement. What's the best way to measure this? And is it reliable and is it valid? So in psych, they're having a big, you know, I hate to call this a crisis, but a lot of people called it a crisis. Um, some other folks wrote a paper calling it the revolution, which I think is a bit better term. Um, where we're just like, you know, we should probably look at these methods that we've been using for 70 or 80 years, and are they any good? Um, and I would say that that's one thing that, that the field, the computational linguistics people I know have done for a long time. Like, what is the best way to measure this? What's the best way to mathematically represent, you know, what we think all the neurons in your head are doing? And that's, I think, probably where the big fights are, mm. is the, the representation um, but also too, like how much can we trust some of these older works um, because maybe they don't replicate or maybe they don't, um, they aren't consistent across language. So I think one thing that's been missing from the field for a long time is it's a bit um, weird, if, if you're familiar with that term, um, Western, educated, industrial, I forget the R, <laughs> democratic. It's a, it's a term from a paper about how many science fields are, are US or Europe centric. Right. And maybe we should de-weird them. And um, I think what, we're, what I've seen is there's a lot of work in English and English is clearly not even the most spoken language across the globe. And it's getting better. But uh, that diversification, I think, would answer a lot of the questions that we probably have. Like, is this model actually representative of language or is it representative of English freshmen? <laughs> right. Mm. So. Mm. Um, so why don't you give me a couple of examples of some some actual uh, studies that you're doing? So yeah, I have a oh, better sense know. of like exactly what you're doing. Sure. Um, a lot of my data is just present because it's text. So we can scrape it from places, um, grab it from the internet. But one study that we've um, recently finished, and I hope to never do again, is a project looking at uh, what do people think words mean? It's very boring to take this study. So we show you a word on the screen, like zebra. I say, what makes a zebra a zebra? And you write things. It's a horse. It's got stripes. It's black, it's white, mm. you know, and you, you list out these features. But that kind of data is super rich. So the best part about going to our conference last year was that data was out and people were uh, presenting new results based on it. So it's kind of fun to get to see people take what was 10 years worth of work and do something else with it. Um, but thousands of words in English, fortunately. <laughs> um, and what that allows us to do is to understand better the relationships between words. So if you wanted to, as a researcher, under, uh, think about priming is what it's called, where two words are very similar. So it helps one helps you process the other. Um, you could come up with a better set because you have this type of data. Or if you were interested in um, how people acquire language. So uh, what makes a word easier to learn? you could use this kind of data as well. And so we were able to, to publish that and um, just give people the data. And so here, run with it. Test it on other, with other hypotheses. Um, and I'm also really interested in these sort of mega studies. So it's a big movement in our, in our area, and at least in psychology, is, is publishing very large data sets, which is what allows other people to build their research. So we're about to start a project that um, does a similar task where we're trying to figure out uh, priming. So priming is this interesting concept that's actually gotten a lot of, um, of recent interest in the fact that it doesn't work. But let's say I show you uh, two words on a screen. So I show you doctor and then I show you nurse. You should be much faster at nurse because you've seen doctor. If I show you tree and then nurse, you're not as fast. And so that implication. Wait, 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 faster at 
Faster at what? Faster at reading nurse. Oh, so if okay. I see doctor first, it helps me read nurse faster. If I see tree first, I don't read nurse faster. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. So the, the implication there is that there's this sort of activation effect of related things in memory, which mm -hmm. can be super important for reading. I mean, political speeches, anytime you're writing. Um, and that's a longstanding effect that we know exists. And so in the last, oh gosh, 10 years or so, there was a giant project that looked at priming over lots and lots of words. And it's very frustrating to learn that it's not reliable <laughs> at all. <laughs> mm. It's very variable. Um, so I, I guess what I would say, and I was part of that project, so I'm, I'm a little biased, it's messy. So what we want to do is follow up and see, is it messy because of the way we did it? Or is it messy because it's messy? And so I really like these methods questions because that allows us to then interpret pre previous scientific results. Um, because I have a better lens at understanding maybe why we got the results, which then can lead to implications in like real human life, right? And mm. not just scientific articles. Hmm. Um, so uh, do you have any, um, uh, as you, as you talk about implications and politics and, uh, and whatnot, this is, uh, this is, uh, every, everyone's the most political they've, they've been since last election right now, if, <laughs> if not even, if not even more so, um, do you have any, um, have you had any kind of ideas for new research opportunities that have come out of out of this pandemic, this quarantine, this this new um, election cycle? Um, it, 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 anything yeah. that you've been thinking about? Oh uh, well, yes and no. So yes, once longstanding. So I have a, a couple former students who are interested in the language thing, but language of politics. So um, one of them was looking at lean or bias, perceived bias. So, you know, if you choose to read Fox News versus if you choose to look at NPR, there's the perception of how those lean, but can we actually, when looking at what they're writing, can we tell? Like, is that just because of their perceptions and their audiences? Or are they actually writing different things? Um, and then one of the other students is looking at political speeches, especially in times of war or conflict and seeing, you know, what are the differences in word use? Can we predict how a Senator might vote on something based on what um, words they were saying before? And you kind of can. Um, this is back mm. to secret life of pronouns. So pronouns are a heavy indicator. Oh, wait, based on what they were saying before... Before the vote. Oh, oh, like leading up to... So mm -hmm. you're not taking, like, the history of, of like, every speech someone's ever made or something like that. You're just, you're just taking what they said specifically about that... Um, right, about that topic, topic leading up to the vote. Yeah. And Interesting. So that, that stuff continues, but now we have much more interesting data, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not that war data isn't interesting, it's good and it's historical, but now it's, it's um, especially th because our presidents are on Twitter now, there are more opportunities to collect speeches, free, free speeches as opposed to planned speeches that somebody else wrote um, for us to process. Uh, and then I'm also, I've joined a, um, I'm in an international group called the Psych Science Accelerator. I'm their techie. And so uh, we've put together a study kind of looking at social psychology and um, the current pandemic, and it actually is supposed to launch today. So good timing. Um, and mainly it's, it's seeing about gentle, I would say, I would call them nudges. So are there there are specific wordings or phrases that we can use that would get people to comply with things that we know we should be doing, like washing our hands, staying at home, social distancing, which is a terrible phrase, but, um, yeah. you know, can is we it, nudge people the right direction? I think it's a famous book called nudge. It's kind of a similar theme. Is it, is it, uh, it, in your opinion, in the, in the way that, um, in the way that, because as as we were talking about 
evolution, you kind of, you did mention slang mm -hmm. and how all of these, uh, as, as someone who's delighted in like looking up past slang or like Western slang or like slang and like older cultures and, and, mm -hmm. and things is, uh, it is is a lot of fun but the, these things seem to uh take a while to change if it, it, once a culture grabs onto something like social distancing which i think is like a terribly inaccurate <laughs> uh, uh way of phrasing what we should be doing mm -hmm. and some people are saying it should be physical distancing or maybe there's just a better word altogether. Are we just stuck with this? Is it gonna be? <laughs> is it gonna be social distancing forever? <laughs> what, what, what would it take? What would to get it rid take? Of it? To, yeah, to get oh, rid of it. <laughs> it has to peak. It hasn't jumped the shark yet, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, I yeah, there. Are, it's interesting because that work also depends on age. So there's a lot of of research on like usage of phrases in cohorts so in different age groups which i don't really want to like say like millennial versus gen z because people don't always affiliate themselves with those terms um so but like there's clearly age chunks and so once it's almost as if once it grows out of a chunk the original age group is like, well, that's not cool anymore. So they move on to something else. And so you see this kind of like ripple effect of how words get used. Um, do, do, phrases. do younger people prone, uh, are, are younger people just prone to, is it like um, more neural flexibility or just trying to be like, or, or, or putting, putting more emphasis, you know, it's more important for a young person to be on like the cutting edge or to be like ahead of whatever the trends are or whatever. Whereas as we age, we don't really uh, care as much of like about whatever the new trend is of the day. And maybe people just wait a little longer before adopting the, the new trends. Is it usually young people like um, uh, lead, leading the way in terms of in, in terms of the the new things taking off? Um. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with like social, social, I don't have the right word. Um, when you are young, right? also too, it's hard to disambiguate these effects from cultural effects of, of access to information, right? So if you're in your 20s, early 20s now, you've pretty much always had the internet and maybe always had a smartphone once you're old enough. But if you're in your 60s, that's certainly not true. So you, you get me in 20 years, we'll have a better answer to this question, I think. But um, also, you're just busier as you age. So it, it, it could be that social effect of needing to define oneself, creating one's identity, and I need to be different than everyone else. And I'm still figuring out who I am. And or I have kids and a life and a job and I don't have time to sit on the internet and watch Netflix all day. <laughs> I guess we do now, but you know, um, it could be a lot of those things going on, but you do see it where it's a, the younger, younger folks, <laughs> um, will start a new slang like, um, uh, I can't think of one that is appropriate to say on a podcast. <laughs> Yeah. like wtf right and yeah. then it slowly will 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 spread so to speak and until your those... until your grandma's finally saying right. wtf and and now that jumps the shark right uh, <laughs> and now we think of something else that's that, why now, those now we go to commercials F were so funny fml yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um trying to but... keep it as pg as i need to <laughs> there also seems to be like a little bit of um um political affiliation drives in there with um with, with like you know you see uh once in a while like uh conservatives will learn a new science word and like really grab onto it of like uh uh like oh cuck 
oh, oh, we can call these people cucks now, or we can, or, or they're, they're virtue signaling, or, or oh, like, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll like find a new word, be like, <laughs> whoa, we learned a science word that we can use against the libs, and then, but, and then, and then, um, you know, then there's in terms of like, uh, the, um, you know, social justice warrior side of things, there's like, trying to stay ahead of the curb and add, you know, you have one side being like, oh, we need to, it can't just be LGBTQ. Now we need to throw an IPA on there as well. And if you don't know the IPA, then you're us, uh, th then you're behind on things. And then, and then the other side of the fence goes like, oh man, what's all these letters? I have the whole alphabet <laughs> soup. And, and, and so there's, yep. uh, there's, um, there's these, uh interesting political differences in the in the way that that uh words and language seem to evolve as well yeah so i have a um a project that one day will see the light of day um but where we were looking at uh moral foundations uh, the work by uh, jesse graham and um oh god I it just don't look and, to me. It Why just jumped right out of my like head. I know that. <laughs> anyway, so if you search moral foundations, you'll you'll sure. find this. Um, I I'm gonna feel bad in an hour when I remember the other person's name. This uh, is that's how it goes. It, yeah. it won't be an hour. You're gonna wake up in the middle of the night. That's yeah. when it's gonna happen. <laughs> um, but like there, the, uh. I'm not interested in the moral part so much. I'm interested in the words, but right. what uh, what some of my students were doing, we were doing was looking at like our, we, we find that these people who adhere to these political labels tend to also separate themselves on these moral foundations of like purity and sanctity. Um, so the whole debate around abortion versus um, authority, deferring to authority, and so we were trying to see if there were, we could see these words pop up. And we looked at um, the swearing in of, of one of the recent Supreme Court. Oh my God. <laughs> Brent, uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. <laughs> I was like, where did Yay! it go? Yeah. Um, and see, I'm not good at words either. That's why I study them. I'm I'm the worst <laughs> with names usually, so I'm glad that we're on the same uh, same page um, there. What was the other thing? Oh, and the uh, the shutdown, the government shutdown, to see because those both have very strong moral cues that each side took a side on, so to speak. And you can see these like small, very subtle differences in the way that people use words. So I think you're right on that. That sides pick a phrase that they can associate with themselves mm -hmm. to to distinguish like in politics term it's really important to you know make sure you're signaling your values and you're distinguishing yourself from your candidate right and um, that's why we have like pro-life versus pro-choice those terms are intentional um, um but you can kind of see just a little bit and it, it tends to what a lot of people think it tends to come back to these kind of internal morals that we try to adhere to. <laughs> and what, what if, what if say um, leaders on both sides, they're, they're like, we, uh, okay, uh, we're, we've been convinced um, bo both uh, Republican and Democratic leaders have been convinced that physical distancing is uh, is uh, for for now the best way forward to uh, buy time until um, uh, science can catch up on what the next steps are in terms of reopening to essential workers and then making more workers essential. Blah blah. blah. Right. Okay. Okay. We're all on the same page now. In terms of in terms of messaging, something like the distancing or like you said, washing hands. It is is there um in terms of understanding your base or understanding personality differences are are there ways in which you can change the language so that the messaging of what is ultimately the same message mm -hmm. gets through to um to different people right well first in this fantasy world 
I think, you know, obviously. I'm no, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really <laughs> taking some, uh, some liberties. I mean, it would help if everyone was giving the same message. I think that's one of the biggest issues we're seeing right now is that the messages are very disparate. Like, you know, well, and there's so many messages too, because we're constant news cycle kind of thing. Um, you know, and it's, I think it's hard for people. Um, so I'm in the Northeast right now, but my traditionally I'm from the South. So it's hard for me to explain to my parents, like, you don't understand. I live like an hour and a half from New York city. It is bad here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go outside. Um, where, you know, we're there in rural nowhere and it doesn't seem like any big deal. Um, and so I think that is another issue kind of too, of like, how do we get people who can't see it to agree to take on this project? Um, which I think I would have thought it would have been very different from times like during Vietnam, right? So during, during some of these previous wars, we didn't show people, they weren't allowed to take pictures of the caskets coming home. And they, they you know, you didn't um, have it on the constant 24 hour news cycle. You didn't have Twitter. And then, you know, during the AIDS crisis, trying to, trying to get that cycle to get people to understand what was going on. And so we, we have all the news, but it's so many different messages in so many different places. So one, we'd have to all be on the same page. I think that would help a lot. Um, but then, yeah, I think you could maybe bias those messages. So some people, and I, I know this, I'm not a social psychologist, but I know this because of the project that we're trying to launch today. Um, that there are people who respond better to gain frames. So uh, they, oh, sorry, I, I missed that. Re gain, gain frames. It's almost like gambling. Um, gain, like I can gain something um, where you have so much to gain. Oh, right? I see. Stay home. You're going to keep, you're going to be able to protect yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. that's, so it's a, a positive it's a reward right you'll start a new hobby maybe <laughs> this is a good time for a career change right <laughs> uh, one um, door quarantines another door open <laughs> <laughs> uh, some people respond better to loss frames or, or negative things mm. so there's a lot to lose here right mm -hmm. you could infect yourself and your family and apparently your cat cats i was reading earlier cats can get this um and so maybe having a mix of those messages so people mm -hmm. who respond better to one hear that and do better and then maybe respond better to the other hear that um so there's a lot of uh cool research on like on how one can nudge these behaviors but i don't think there's any consistency like there's not one message i don't think because mm -hmm. people we know people respond to these things differently mm -hmm. um but if we could all get on the same page, that would help. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just in terms of, if you look at the last two um, presidential um, platforms, it was like hope and change of like, the future has all of these possibilities for uh, progress and, and then making things great again. Like uh, mm -hmm. we, the, the future is, uh, we want to, we want to go back we want we value tradition and the way mm -hmm. that things have always um been and and uh and those are i mean i i probably uh I'm, I'm sure if i had a personal an actual personality researcher on here they'd be like well actually mm -hmm. but um <laughs> it, you know ju just people's writing in terms of openness how how open they are to different new experiences is going to be um, is going to factor into how they're going to respond to that kind of languaging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also, too, uh, I think people, I, the, having a slogan really helps. So I have my students in one of our classes analyze that Make America Great Again slogan. So you look at it like pre and post election to see like what are the most related words when we use um, either great or make before and after, and it totally switches. So that was a great slogan to get elected. Once it was elected, done. Yeah. Um, 
now we're about to have data into the next election cycle. So it'll be interesting to see when and if it comes back. Um, so those slogans are very powerful. Hmm. Um, just any marketing person would tell you this. And I feel like if I look at the, the that election, the last election cycle, um, one side clearly had a good slogan going, even if you agree with it or not. And the other side's not so much. Like the message is what you were saying, but it, there's no catchphrase mm. for that. So, you know, and I think America's pretty divided on on voting right now. They were very close if we look at the raw numbers, not the mess that the electoral college is. Um, but if it's catchy, mm. I, I'm going when I run in um, 2032 um because i'm gonna need a little time to prep and kind of turn around some of my things and enough people to forget as some of my past <laughs> mistakes or enough time for, but my i think my slogan is going to be everyone gets a slogan no <laughs> no more just politicians getting these powerful slogans i'm i'm giving the power back in the people's hands everyone gets a slogan 2032 there you go <laughs> Um, what, what, um, do you, do you do much in terms of, um, of marketing or ads or anything like that? Is that anything that you look at in, in no, your research? Be, no, but I have the right background, if that makes sense. I mean, some of psychology's best researchers turned into marketers. Um, so there are uh, certainly could if people want to pay me for this, um, yeah. suggest word choice. Like you always have to be careful with, with specific words that have multiple meanings. Um, Cause that could, you never sure how they're getting interpreted. So obviously um, most marketing teams have like a group of researchers who help them pilot test. I mean, movies do this too. That's why it's like, well, the original ending was blah, blah, blah. Well, I never saw that ending. Well, it's because people hated it. <laughs> so they cut it. Right. Um, but testing, uh, word choice. We talk a lot about in my class search engine optimization. So how do you know what keywords to use to get people to your uh, page, your company, your ad, your product, whatever? Uh, that one doesn't get you in trouble because there are there are ways that Google will block or ban you if you do certain things. Uh, but two matches the meaning, but isn't necessarily the same words. So. Uh, the algorithms that peop that um, are used when, let's say, you type something into Google and then the pages that come back, like how can we take advantage of how we know the algorithm works and how we know that word meaning works to get the right keywords to get people to your stuff? Um, so we talk about, you know, words that are similar synonyms and then being careful of, of pot, what are called polysemes or words that have multiple meanings. Some of them are not what you want, right? Um, and then how those algorithms work. Hmm. Uh, do you do you ever look at um, kind of the etymology, or and and then kind of how how words themselves evolve and change over time? Where all of a sudden, I I I know there's like um, there's not that many words in the English language that have been around like from the beginning and right. haven't and haven't changed their usage or or meaning or anything but even term even even things in terms of uh in ter like like take meme for example uh, the, the the origins of the word meme and then what and then what people see on the internet of like a cat meme mm -hmm. are two very different things which is like this uh, like kind of beautifully tragic thing to happen to the word meme itself that, that See, it, 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 tweet tweet is the the fun one uh, what what's what did like, tweet used to be like birds birds oh, tweet i forgot that <laughs> that's how oh yeah birds tweet I, I didn't even but but that's you know people uh, uh, there's slang where bad can mean a different thing mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. bad can mean good now and all of it. Uh, uh, do you do you ever look at anything like that? 
Oh, just for fun, not for just research. For uh, <laughs> so Google's ingrams is the best way to look at this kind of data. Um, there's a really great TED talk. It's one of my favorite ones about, uh, I think it's called, what can we learn from 5 million books or something like that, where uh, it's a lot of the guys from Google and I think from MIT talking about um, what they did with the data when they scanned all of the books uh, that you can see on Google books now. Yeah. And they talk about some really cool work called cultureomics is kind of the label they've given it where you can look at trends in lots of things. Like when did the past tense usage of a word change? So when did we switch from saying burnt to burned or vice versa? And there's a cultural switch there based on, um, on, um, location so american english dropped it like it was hot so to speak <laughs> and british english held on to it because we were trying to distance ourselves and then slowly they've switched as well i don't remember which direction but you can see it so if you google uh, go to Ann graham's website and look up burnt and burned you can see the point at which they change sides one of them dropped off and the other one got more popular yeah i just had someone yell at me on twitter not the bird chirping but the <laughs> social media platform oh, there it's on this side i guess i'm weird um i uh i said um something about i had some tweet about i think my tweet was it's ironic that people that are into numerology aren't typically aren't good at math um and then someone was like it's maths and i was like oh that's very european you just got very worked up about that <laughs> um anyway it reminded me of that when you yeah because it's mathematics technically you don't say mathematic yeah 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 um so anyhow back to the work that you do before before we leave the project that you're launching today yes. this is I'm capturing history right now. Yes. <laughs> um, why, why don't you uh, maybe tell people a little bit more about what it is, what you're expecting, and then how people could maybe um, follow it or, or learn more about it? Because this, by the time that this comes out, some time will have elapsed. I'm not sure right. how much. Yeah. So... Uh, I don't want to tell too much about like the internal workings because if it's only like a week, we're still going to be collecting data and I don't want to screw it up. But mm -hmm. um, the Psych Science Accelerator is a team that I work with that is meant to be the CERN for psychology. So the idea is that if things don't replicate because we don't have enough people, or we haven't tested it, why don't we just get more people? And so it's a, t a collaborative team of hundreds of research labs across the globe just so cool because that gives me so much access to other languages I don't normally have access in for my own personal bias. Um, and they've completed several projects. You said you've talked to Lisa, she, um, De Bruin, she was one of the first projects they picked for, for one of their studies. And what we're doing is, you know, we have the a capacity to collect data across the globe, which not many people have that kind of access. So we put out a call and people suggested studies. We picked three of them and we're currently about to launch the English version of the study. So if you take it, it will be about COVID, um, you know, how you've responded, how you react to certain messages, um, so I can't say what you're going to see because it depends on when you take it, if you take it, but the project itself will eventually hopefully get published and um, will be on the psych science website. And if this happens fast enough, you can actually track, we have a tracker to see how, what languages that people have taken it in and um, how many people we have to show that we're truly trying to capture people and not just the weird countries to go back to our conversation mm -hmm. earlier um so for example i know we have we've gotten some money for this so we're going to be able to capture some data in africa which is a traditionally very hard country to get data from if you're not there um it's always really just a study to look at kind of the relationship between you know what you are currently doing and feeling and maybe how we could help nudge those behaviors to the 
what we believe are the correct ones, you know, staying home, washing your hands, that kind of thing. Mm. But not giving too much away. <laughs> so I don't run the study. And get yeah, yelled at. right, right. Um, but I've been helping on the technical implication and implementation of, um, you know, setting up the details to collect so much data. Most of us work with very small data sets of 100 people or several hundred people. And this is potentially in the large thousands. So like, just the technical impl implementation of that's pretty difficult. Um, and I think hopefully it will go well today, <laughs> uh, the launch. And people could take this study too, um, if you feel like filling it out. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Erin, for joining me. Of course. Yeah, it was fun. And we kind of like wandered lots of random I'm places. I'm a wanderer. <laughs> Especially, I'm not a social psychologist, but I, here are I the know, things I know. I know. Well, <laughs> uh, well, you can tell that I'm I'm not the best bullshitter in the world because when I... <laughs> When I don't know a subject very well, I'm grasping at straws for anything, <laughs> any <laughs> anything that I've heard about ever before that's anywhere near related in the ballpark. So, so I appreciate you uh, uh, in indulging me and um, and helping fill me in and uh, and a subject that I am uh, uh, that I'm definitely very new to. Excellent. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next episode. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are.